All right. It's two. All the folks assembled. Um, this is the Thursday, October 14th meeting of the Technology Committee. Um, if we could put the agenda up, please. Can you see it? No, ma'am. Oh, there you go. There you go. I got it. All right. Um, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which is one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, okay, we need an approval of the agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Three zero. Uh, any public comments? No, sir. Oops. That motion says we're all absent. Um, kind of general. <laughs> Good, yeah. I've been watching all these science fiction movies and that scared me. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. Uh, no public comments. Uh, the next order of business is approval of the committee meeting minutes from September 9th. I move we approve the uh, committee meeting minutes of September 9th. Okay. Uh, no discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Okay. Next item is OE 17.11, uh, broadband expansion. We touched on this last time, uh, and I think, um, is this yours, Tanya? Yes, sir. I'm gonna do this report, and then the remaining items will be uh, done by Mark. We, we split up the tasks for the, for the meeting, so we um, shared, shared the information or shared the wealth. <laughs> All right. So OE 17.11 uh, states that we ensure continued engagement with technology partners for broadband expansion. So over the course of the last um, month and a half, we've had uh, two meetings so far uh, regarding broadband. And everyone can hear me okay? Yep, okay, okay. Um, so our first, our, first our first meeting was on September 8th uh, with uh, Dr. Rodriguez, um, Mr. Shohan and I met with uh, Jared Fralix, who's a, an assistant county administrator, and Heather Rath, she's a consultant for the uh, Beaufort County. Uh, she, I believe she works at the state level and uh, works a consultant in this area uh, for other entities. Um, there was a particular um, discussion of a potential of proposal for a satellite-based program called Starlink. Starlink is operated by the SpaceX program, which is a venture of Elon Musk. So you may have heard of SpaceX. Um, it's, all, it's sort of sitting on the same at Kennedy Space Center. They have a, a operation there next to NASA. I know because I went to a, a, a vacation spot there recently. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in it because it all came together once I got back to the office and had this meeting. Um, so this North America, uh, SpaceX is providing satellite internet services. They're, sh they're shooting rockets into space, placing satellites into, I think, the lower atmosphere and providing satellite internet services to um, in homeowners or worldwide. 
It's a relatively new program. They have a in beta form and they do offer an angel sponsorship to allow uh, individual entities to pay for others internet services on their behalf. Um, so some entities like uh, municipalities are looking to potentially um, fund these this venture on with their uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, the county is discussing with their council a potential pilot program and was just seeking interest uh, from the school district on what we thought uh, just kind of informing us, educating us about this program, and then just kind of gauging our interest in the area. Of course, nothing was committed. Uh, we've since researched this a little more, and then we have another, uh, had another meeting with another, um, another group, which you'll see in this document a little further down. And so, of course, we're still um, in the just gathering information stage. So this uh, venture would, of course, serve underserved families in uh, rural areas that would be, we would uh, zero in on pockets of areas that were un currently unserved or high poverty. So the second meeting we had on September 30th was with a rural utility group. It's a nonprofit organization that lays fiber um, throughout nor, uh, rural parts of counties throughout the state. So for example, St. George, uh, Barnwells are some of the areas they have um, put fiber and they're looking to propose uh, an option for us to serve. They, they are slightly into Beaufort County in the northern, very northernmost part of the county and looking to move, uh, extend that uh, fiber into some of our most rural, rural areas in the very northernmost part of the county. Um, it would make a, a very high speed connection, um, uh, probably one of the, the best connections you could receive as far as your internet service. Uh, and it would be a permanent investment, permanent infrastructure that's laid into the ground and then would allow families have the opportunity to connect to that fiber and, and connect, uh, subscribe with them as the internet service provider. Uh, it would be um, a permanent investment, uh, but it would not connect directly to the homes at that point. Uh, and in, we were informed that there are some um, opportunity program, programs that provide uh, folks that are um, lower income to be able to afford uh, at a, a discounted rate those internet service subscriptions. So, um, so this, it was very interesting, very two different um, proposals that were brought forward with us. Uh, to us and but so we thought you know we really know that there's a lot more work being done throughout the state um, on this topic so first of all we want to connect with our hard gray service service provider and so we've reached out to schedule a meeting and we we have yet to schedule it so we're waiting on a response and we should be getting that within uh, very shortly and we'll be setting that up to meet with Hargrave to see what their plans are, um, expansion regarding broadband expansion in our area. And then we know that the state is doing, making some movement uh, and efforts toward um, on this topic as well. So we definitely want to uh, continue to keep as informed as possible on what their efforts are. So um, that's all the update I have for today, but uh, we are, learning a lot about it. I'm learning a lot about it. Um, Mr. Shohan's been involved in it in many years past, so he has a depth of understanding, but um, we will continue to have these ongoing conversations until it's such time that we come back with a recommendation, um, you know, to the board. With that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, 
I was reading, sorry, my boy, I'm losing my voice. Uh, when you say you met with a utility company, which I'm and then it says down here, it says that um, they would, that you would then basically subscribe with the utility company uh, for internet service provider. Can you explain to me what you mean by utility company? It sounds like we're being purposely vague. I don't want to tip anything off. I just don't know. I'm not sure what they're saying there. Well, I'm, Mark, you want to take that one? Yes. Um, we met with um, Palmetto uh, Telephone, Rural Telephone Cooperative. So they basically maintain the old, old um, Southern Bell and Ma Bell lines um, for on the telephone and DSL side. They run most of the rural um, substations throughout uh, South Carolina, and they really fill the niche where the bigger players like your Comcast, your Hard Grays, really haven't moved into these rural areas because of the population factors. It's not cost effective for those big companies to move in. Um, and since they already have copper lines and some fiber in these areas, they are doing what they can, working with the state um, ORS and different um, federal programs to expand their plant as much as possible. Okay. <clears throat> but they're talking about adding fiber and not using the current infrastructure? That is correct. At this time, the areas of Northern Beaufort County that they're looking to expand in, um, they do not have current plant in and they would be moving fiber into those areas and subdivisions to support those households. So, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll put my hand back up. I don't know. I get conversational. Right, right. right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, because I have talked to a, a friend at Hargrave about this and they, you know, Hargrave's looked at it or whatever. And like you said, they've kind of determined it's not cost effective because of the cost per, you know, a foot of cable versus how many houses you have and how spread out they are, right? So would they be, they're not gonna run fiber all the way to the house. They're probably running fiber to like a central location and then having, are they gonna try and use the copper wire DSL to connect to the fiber? Uh, that's correct. The last mile will more than likely be still on a copper plant. So what kind of um, speed would that give the average household on that plan? Um, it would be around five megs up and 25 megs down. So it would support most of our video conferencing technologies and the different applications our students and teachers use. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Dick, anything? I guess not. Um, he said no. No. Okay. Um, this seems like the horizon is a long way off. So, and I, I know we're all impatient, but this is this is just the way it is, right? Um, everybody's moving on it. I'm surprised copper is going to be sufficient, but if you say it is, Mark, I'll I'll take your word for it. And the satellite thing, you know, I. I had some experience with HughesNet, and uh, I'm not a big fan of the satellite uh, reliability. So, Mark, you're on mute. You're on mute, Mark. Sorry about that. If I could comment on that a little bit, um, the HughesNet used a old uh, technology. Their satellites were at 150 miles in geosynchronous orbit, so the download speed, the download was quick but your upload was still on a copper connection going to a substation to be beamed back up to the satellite. Um, and that was the biggest downfall. Also being in the geosynchronous orbit, you had a lot more problems with the refra refraction from clouds and um, other um, astro astrological based uh, phenomenon. Um, with the low based, uh, low uh, or orbit based of um, Starlink, they have found methods to get around that and increase bandwidth. The bandwidth for the Starlink program is looking to be about 110 to 112 megs down and anywhere from 20 to 25 megs up. So it's about four to five times the capabilities of a DSL plant. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid? 
I was just going to respond a little bit. I mean, I had Hughes net as well, and I think Starlink's a totally different uh, proposal, but I think it's still a fair ways off before it becomes something that's, you know, an everyday plan for people. But I like this sec the, the, the uh, idea of using the copper because we kind of abandoned the DSL infrastructure um, a while ago. And because we had the, but for, for a rural organization, if they, how fast do you think they could run the fiber out to these nodes? I don't think that would take that long. I don't think it's that far off. Um, and their estimations, because they're going to be kind of cherry picking um, areas, <laughs> they're still expecting an eight to 12 month uh, installation time. So, um, but generally speaking, it's generally uh, 18 months to 24 months out when a communications company um, plans new plant design. So they'd have to build the plant first. I mean, they're gonna do that here first. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's just that then the basically we'd have all that infrastructure. Anyone who has a phone line would be able to get on board, right? Richard. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm going to Battery Point. And Battery Point was uh, started in 1995, so it's relatively new. Uh, we have fiber out to Robert Smalls, and we have copper from Robert Smalls into our uh, subdivision. Uh, my subdivision has a large number of uh, people that are working from home. I am at the district office right now because yesterday during the operations, uh, committee meeting, uh, I barely could keep abreast of the Zoom for that. So, uh, and I, I got, I'm supposed to have hard rate for 200 megs. I haven't gotten 200 megs yet. And right now I've been pulling maybe 20, 25 megs because all the, and I've got the dual, dual wire coming into my house. And it's because the pipe between Robert Smalls and my neighborhood is just overwhelmed. So I have, I, it's not as much of a problem perhaps out in the rural areas, but there is still a problem uh, for people, students in my neighborhood being able to Zoom and the bandwidth required for that until we get fiber to the home. So it's not just a rural issue, but it's also, and I can imagine what the heavy suburb areas in Bluffton are like as far as uh, usage. And I don't know if, if, if they're already fibered to the house, I doubt it, but th that's, an, that's also a uh, problem I see. Thank you. Uh, that's kind of important because that changes the focus. Um, from rural underserved areas to areas that have insufficient bandwidth. Um, right now, I think we're focused on the rural underserved areas, but uh, is there, when we get, when we got those um, statistics from Hargrave and, and the other providers that showed us where they, where they weren't serving, I think they told us where they weren't serving, but we couldn't ask the people, but Harvey could tell us. Um, was there a, an issue in, in, in Bluffton or any, uh, other areas? We know Whale Branch, we know Lubico, we know, we know that, that that's a rural area, but to, to Dick's point, are there pockets in you know, populated areas that are also deficient? Um, yes, sir, there are. Um, even on Ladies Island, um, Ladies Island was formerly an old U.S. cable um, plant, which was only a 550 megahertz plant, which was bought out by Comcast. Unfortunately, the MO for most of the big companies is they buy that small plant and they start generating revenue from it. They don't expand it a lot. Um, it served Ladies Island okay for years, but as uh, Ladies Island continues to grow and add subdivisions, they are starting to tax the bandwidth capable from that, that megahertz plant and are gonna need significant upgrades in that infrastructure also. 
in the future. That, yeah, that seems to be something outside of our purview, though. Um, I'm not sure anybody can step in and to, to, to alleviate that issue because it's a private business. And, uh, although I think the president is trying to do that, but um, I know that's difficult. All right, Mr. Smith. Uh, I was going to answer your question. It said we definitely do uh, have some of those pockets on St. Helena. And, uh, and, then, and then I was going to say Lays Island as well, but he said Lays Island. But yeah, on Lays Island and St. Helena, we have those pockets uh, where the internet is definitely hard to get or almost incredible to get in certain areas. That's all I was going to Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Um, we have a recommended motion here. Mrs. Crosby just put her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Tanya. I'm sorry. I couldn't find my um, raising my electronic hand fast enough. Um, just want to make one last point. Another obstacle or an obstacle that we found recently, we attempted to pull data, student data, um, and did on um, underserved homes. Uh, basically, in our registration this year, there was a question, do you have internet service, yes or no? Um, as we registered our students, I know that because I have a child in, the, in, in our high, one of our high schools. And um, also, we have poverty data in Power School. Um, our data services folks were able to pull that data, but the problem is we cannot share that data with anyone other than there by uh, FERPA laws, the Federal Educational Rights and Protection Act. We cannot share that data with county or municipality or um, outside officials. So that's one, uh, we can, they can share information with us and we can utilize that to maybe pinpoint areas. But so that is another um, little hurdle we have to work through as we identify areas. But you're right, we do have a map from um, across the entire county. And with the exception of Hilton Head, there are pockets throughout the entire county um, whether it be Bluffton to Sheldon to St. Helena uh, throughout the county that do have under underserved areas. So, um, but I just wanted to let you all know some of the things that we encountered as, as we have begun to look through this process. So. Did you call my name? Uh, yes, got really, okay, got really quiet for a second. Um, I'm going to make the motion here, but also responding to what Tanya said, I think the other thing is for this OE 1711, we're talking about one thing. The other piece of this is there's, you know, Whale Branch, there's an actual access. Hilton Head, I'm sure that everyone has access, but whether or not who's paying the bill, who's actually like provide, you know, in the, does the internet does the home have internet? That's the second question. So, um, but I'm prepared to make this motion because I'm going to read it. I feel really confident about it. Are you ready? Okay. I move that the technology committee recommend to the full board to accept OE 1711 titled ensure continued engagement with technology partners for broadband expansion. I second the motion. Discussion. All those in favor, aye. 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 It's unanimous. So that'll go on the consent agenda. Um, yes. Yes, sir. I'll put it. I'll put it. I'll put it. Yes. Okay. Next, get that agenda back up. Update on computer labs. Um, this is a focal point for Dick. Uh, and I guess Mark, you're gonna you're gonna take this one. Um. Yes. Um. And. I'm sorry about the uh, naming scheme I used. I used our internal naming scheme. And uh, just to kind of let you uh, have an idea of how it's laid out, the first identifying letter signifies either an academy school for River Ridge or Robert Smalls. The D signifies a district office location for the district office and adult ed. Um, E's for elementary, M's for middle, and H's for high school. The reason we use this is we uh, add this nomenclature to all of our assets. And that way we can tell very quickly if we have an elementary school um, asset 
that ends up in a middle school or a high school. Um, so it just very easily helps us when we're looking in Active Directory and some of the systems we use. David? Yes, sir. So the, the reason I ask for this is as I walk through these schools, I see empty computer classrooms. Uh, to me, these are dinosaurs. This is what we started out when we were thinking about Classroom 21 back in the 90s. And now that we have the one-to-one -one devices, I wonder why we even have these labs and, and what utility uh, we get out of these labs. And should we keep upgrading these labs? That's the reason that I brought this up. It's a space issue and it's a utility issue for me. Right, Mark. Okay. Um, some of the main reasons we maintain labs still is because there's a lot of uh, applications that cannot be run on a student uh, desktop. I mean, a student laptop. The reason for that is we don't want to pay the Maserati price for something that's going to be used as a Honda Accord most of the time. So, and uh, for one. Um, <laughs> For one example, um, or I guess our biggest example in mainly our high schools and middle schools would be our Project Lead the Way and CAKE programs. These are very high-end AutoCAD programs, Photoshop programs, um, and that require a lot of computer power. Um, the good thing about the cost of these programs is they're being funded by um, state and uh, federal grants so it's not a cost to the district to refresh the equipment in these labs. Um, another way we use them especially in our elementary school is to help develop the um, computer process. They use them for a lot of our Lego labs um, where they build Lego robotics, uh, VEX robotics, and these programs are run on either Windows or Android um, systems to help engage the kids in um, future learning. We have made a strong effort to reduce the amount of labs. Um, I could say uh, just for one school uh, to bring out would be uh, Buford High School. Uh, less than five years ago, they had 16 labs. So it's been a conscious effort that we've worked with instruction and the school administration to help repurpose these labs and let the schools know that there's a lot of stuff that can be done on the student's uh, laptop and you don't need these labs for as many programs, only for some specialized applications. Ingrid? Yeah, that, I mean, what Mark was saying, you're having kids in the school, my son's gonna be in that Project Lead the Way computer program. I think part of it is though, it's almost a naming problem because in my mind, I see them as technology labs. I mean, we could do 3D printing, we could do computer repair and technology. I think that the idea that this is a computer lab where you come and get your little dot matrix printer <laughs> to print out your reading assignment, you know, maybe we should just sort of rebrand them a little bit um, in, you know, for this year, you know, call them like technology labs or Google Maker has a great program. I don't, do we have any Google Maker spaces in, uh, in the schools? You know, Mark? Um, Colleen? Uh, do you have any? Oh, Colleen, sorry. My ears uh, are stuck up. Not Google specific. There are some media centers in some places that have put in some maker spaces, but not Google specific at okay. this point. I would just say, you know, maker lab idea or something like that would probably give people a better idea and it makes us sound a little more forward thinking. We do have um, a lot of schools participating in the different um, maker labs um, and getting their kids into um, using these um, advanced printing processes. Um, one thing we have been hesitant to release it to th some of the schools that's requested is the lasers. Um, there's a a little bit scary to have the lasers in a student setting, um, eyes, fires, um, and just the simple fact that they put the wrong material under this laser, it will give off um, hazardous fumes if you don't have a fume hood above it. So we have really um, kind of 
been hesitant to let any burning or lasers into our schools? Um, I'm going to go back to Dick and does this satisfy uh, what you were looking for, Dick? Or is there a next step you think we should take? Well, I would sure like to see some data on usage because when I walk through the schools and with the principal, I say, how much is this used? And I get the uh, educator salute. You know, I, I don't really know. Uh, it doesn't seem to be very much. And I've been told when I started uh, in this business, uh, putting in Classroom 21, I was told, well, you got to have this because laptops will never be capable of supporting the kinds of programs that these desktops uh, and full PCs will be able to, to uh, use. And that, frankly, is not true. Uh, maybe we need more cap some more capable laptops for these individual students taking higher level uh, classes, uh, higher demand, technology demand. It just seems to me that I, I see a classroom it's empty. I don't like to see classrooms that are empty. Uh, that causes me problems when I talk to constituents about our uh, capacity issues. So uh, I, I think I need to see a little more information on, on use, uh, number of hours, number of times uh, that each, each uh, computer in the lab gets used. We should be able to get that kind of use data to say, okay, yeah, we definitely have a use and uh, it's a cost effective piece. And, and then I would be convinced right now when I see that some schools still have six, uh, some schools have five, some schools have one, some school, middle schools I'm talking. There's a middle school with one, there's a middle school with four, there's a middle school with zero, okay? High school with five, high school with six, high school with one. Uh, this data causes me some questions. Okay, hey, uh, Mark, is that doable to do the metering and so we, um, we, get some? we should be able to uh, break that down a little bit more. Okay, is usage sets. Ingrid, Ms. Boatwright. Kids are, you know, I was just going to comment, kids are going back to desktops. If you're a high-end gamer, you, you don't do it on a laptop. You're doing it on desktops, and kids are building their own desktops now, which I think is a pretty cool thing. So I think that there are things, the way my kids use them, <clears throat> and I have two in college, they don't want to spend a bunch of money on a laptop, A, because someone can just, you know, take it, um, B, that everything's cloud-based. So all they're looking for in a device is a device to access, you know, their day-to-day -day stuff in the cloud. But if you're going to do high-end gaming or CAD design or Photoshop, you really, I think that, that having a computer lab and having the kids being able to like build and take apart, we have two $12 million, or not two, we have $12 million grants with two programs, biomedical, I think, and um, cybersecurity. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? I, you know, those computer labs would be great for that, for kids to go in and, and, and do that kind of work. I don't really think that we can run a really successful cybersecurity on an HP 360. But I don't know, maybe Mark can answer that. But I, I, I think you're right about usage and smart usage, but I definitely think there's still a, a path forward for computer labs in the schools. Yes, I would definitely agree with uh, Ms. Boatwright. And for our CAKE program, we have gotten away from the desktops for some of the uh, more high-end ZBook laptops, um, just for the simple fact that they can bring them out and move around um, a lab or a different area as they're working on projects, especially in the Kate areas. Um, it also allows us to lock those in a uh, laptop cabinet at the end of the day to better secure them. So the next step, I think, is to get that usage data, and then we'll we'll look and see if we have uh, something obvious jump out from that that we can act on. Is uh, you good with that, Dick? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. 
multifunctional printers. So multifunctioning printers are the direction that the district wants to go in the future. Um, they have been our steps for the last probably five years. Um, we've been working with multifunction printers. Um, it's a lot easier for us. Uh, we have a lot more controls on what's being printed, um, to be able to look at reports on who's been printing, to even meter our users. So uh, some principals say, okay, you're allowed this much budget a month of printing. Um, one of our biggest things we've tried to accomplish over the last eight years is to stop killing trees and move into the digital age. All of our students use Google Drive, they use Microsoft, they, we have our own SAN storage. Um, it's just so easy now to move that data electronically that we don't really need to take the time to print. Um, and some of that is a ecosystem thing. Um, some people just like to hold the piece of paper in their hands um, and slowly we're bringing them around. Um, but we do still have some use cases for one-off printers and areas. Um, some of the big things, uh, every building, your bookkeeper, your data specialist, your nurse, your guidance counselor, um, some of your office managers. These are positions that handle a lot of uh, PII, personal identifiable information, um, and they don't really want that sitting on a printer. Now with our multifunction printers, they do not print out the whatever you send to them immediately. You have to walk up to them and badge swipe, but still some people feel that some of that data even if they're sitting there and there's other people in the room, they don't want it to be seen. Um, some of that is also for when IEP meetings and items like that are being held. Documents need to be printed up for the parents while they're there. Um, so that's some of the use cases we use. And much like just talking about, um, can we justify all of these printers by usage? Because I know we have meters on all the printers. So. Um, for the multifunctional ones, we definitely can. The way we spread those out was on an equity based, depending on how big the school and how the school was laid out. So that basically each wing had a copy room or a teacher work room that these would be housed in. Where it gets harder to quantify it is um, with some of the standalone smaller network printers. Um, we went through a phase in the 2000s and early teens where in new construction, the idea was to put a printer in every classroom or in the workroom between two classrooms. Um, we quickly found out that that was very expensive and not really a way we want to go for the future. Um, but one thing we don't want to do is that if we have these devices that are still functional and we are still got supplies stored for them, we would let the schools use out that toner and that supplies as long as the device still works. We own the device, so it's pretty much a win-win. Now, when it breaks, it's out the door. That makes sense. Dick? Thank you, David. Uh, couple of issues that I had in, in my experience with the printers. Uh, when I went to a community college and we had uh, printer issues, I, I looked at it and found out that we had a number of different vendors providing printers. Um, I went out and did a competitive um, process with multiple vendors to, to handle all the printers. And I was able to save almost 30% on the cost of printers by doing that, by combining them into one, uh, one vendor. And uh, I had, they competed, the vendors competed by cost and by uh, technology. That was number one. Second thing I found out that many of the multifunctional printers were being misused by teachers that were copying copyright material and passing it out into the class. And if you want, really want to get into trouble, uh, violate copyrights will get you there. So uh, computer printer controls 
are also essential. And if you have a printer in a classroom, uh, you basically will have one person with maybe a swipe card to be able to authorize it, but you don't have a lot of control over what's printed. Uh, the paper costs are tremendous. The, the ink costs are also can be significant. And it is a management issue. When I look at the number of printers that we have, um, I would just like to hear from Mark on what he does to manage costs and manage uh, the, uh, the use. It's extremely hard, and your statements are exactly the reasons why we've been moving away from the standalone printers. Um, you would come into a building and see a stack of flyers for a local community organization being printed on the printers and different items like that. Um, that was one of the biggest reasons for the push for the multifunctional printers and the more control with paper cut, because it's very easy to see that X user just printed off 200 sheets of a document. Um, another good thing about the multifunctionals is the security aspect. The hard drives in these computers are encrypted. So even if the device was to be stolen or taken from our buildings, any print um, spool data that was still on that device is not discernible um, and it's uh, secure. We don't have that with our older ones. Another good thing about our multifunction ones is we do have a, a contract with Sharp. And anytime there's any firmware updates, their engineers come in and do them. They also come in and do preventive maintenance on them on a regular basis, which is something that is very hard to do when you have uh, on the network printer side that we're down to about 600 now, but uh, that's a lot of cycles by technicians to go check them, work on them when they have jams and malfunctions and do the necessary updates to keep them network viable. All right, and any uh, further questions or is there a next step on this? The district side, we are steadily working to continue to reduce that number per site as these devices come out of date or either firmware updates are no longer made for them. Do you have an omnibus contract for your printers or do you have multiple vendors? For the printers, they have been multiple vendors over the years. For the uh, MFPs, we do have a contract with Sharp. So it's a one-stop shop. Um, and they also carry our HP um, plotters. Most of our schools maintain a poster printer in their media center for the school. So that is also on our Sharp contract and they will maintain those devices also. All right, so it seems to me that the only next step would be in the future, I don't know, next year, maybe six months, You'd give us an update on how we're how we're doing, getting rid of the of the dinosaurs. I can do that. Okay, that's, that's the only thing I see, unless unless Ingrid or or Dick have a something else. We'll just leave it at that and move on to the next item. And this is Ingrid's focus, the connect to learn device contract. Um, and do you want to tee this up, Ingrid? I, I think you have something specific that you were focused on. Yeah, I'm not asking that with my voice. Um, this has been brought to me by a number of parents of uh, how one of the, I'll tell you right off front, the, one of the main questions is, that I think it's $635, according to that. I had not seen the Connect Learn Handbook before, so that was good. And I just registered my child this year. I think we should probably have, do we have an electronic version of that somewhere that's easy to find? Absolutely. It's on our webpage under um, our Connect to Learn documents under families and uh, students. Um, so on that, on that document, it said it was $635 to replace the G5, and I think $591 to replace the G1. If you go on Amazon, you can get a G5 for 320. Um, and then in addition to which some of the repair costs are a lot higher than you would have out in the community. So my thought was we maybe had a contract with HP 
that basically did this? Or is it possible that if someone you know, has an issue with the computer, they can take it to a third party and have it repaired or replaced, you know, ordered off Amazon. Um, as of right now, we maintain an accidental um, device with um, HP. So if any other third party repairer was to touch that device, it would void all warranty. And we do list that in our Connect to Learn documents. Um, we have had parents try to take them apart and fix them themselves. Um, I think one of the biggest values we get is this is not a consumer grade peripheral. This is a, a device that has been purposely built for the K-12 industry. So it's had hardened factors in a lot of the uh, corners, a lot of the areas, a lot of the components inside of it. Um, we get that question a lot from families. Hey, I can go to Walmart and buy a $350, $400 computer. And you can. Um, but uh, I guarantee you, if you do the standard five foot drop test, um, you won't have as good res of results from that device as you would from these hardened devices that we buy from Dell or HP or whoever. Do we contract with them and they provide those devices to us because we're K through 12 or is that just something, I mean, how does that work? Um, all of these vendors are listed on state contract. So what we do is when we get ready to buy new devices, we reach out to all the major vendors and they do provide pricing that is under state contract because of a big purchase buy. But some of the key things that we have to look for, look at is also our service and warranty processes. Right. Um, we had certain vendors um, that said that they would love to take our business and give us, you know, five, $10 cheaper on a device but then we, they would not supply um, technicians to be in our local area or be housed close by. So then you're boxing up a device, you're mailing it off, you're waiting two weeks to get it back. Um, our process now is HP has provided um, two technicians uh, to reside here in Beaufort County and to fix our devices um, daily. So they come by our schools and pick up devices repair them and then bring them back to our schools. So we always have to look at the value adds we get from one contract over another. Okay, so the, the, are they dedicated to us, these two HP technicians, or are they just basically have a commitment that they'll have technicians in the area? Um, they have a commitment There's they'll have technicians. They are pretty much dedicated to us, but I, I can't say whether they're 100%. Um, how many repairs, because one thing, you know, that's an issue, if you've got a $635 replacement cost, not that it's a huge difference between 300, how do we handle it when people don't have $635? Do we have a process for that? Um, basically, any, um, any first repair is free. So with the $20 technology fee, um, your first repair is always free. Um, if the device is stolen, and you provide us a police report, you will get one device replacement a year free. Um, but the issue comes in, I guess, like you said, if somebody breaks more than one device within that time period, we do work with um, parents uh, in need. We provide opportunities to do promissory notes and make payments at the school level. Um, and some parents do do that where they may pay $5 a week um, for so many weeks to cover the cost of repairs. So, um, so that anticipating Dave's question. Let me so, interrupt. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith's got his hand up, and then we'll come back <clears throat> to you. Okay. Sounds good. All right, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, with, with, within that, uh, I had a parent last year to tell me that, that, that actually at the beginning of this year that she turned in her, well, I, well actually, my parents in the process of turning these computers in at the end of the year, how do you how do you bill parents for, for any for any damages that you find? What's that process like? Yeah. Um, at the end of the year, we do a collection before the kids leave school, and that can be all the way up to the last day of school. Um, and these kids are to bring the device by. We do a check-in, and usually in our media center areas where they'll get on the line and they'll bring their device and let it be looked at. At the time it's being looked at, it's roughly assessed for damages and those damages are written out at that time. Um, 
usually they are provided to the parents, possibly in a report card or either a uh, note is depending on when the damage is and the notes could be sent home with the students. Different schools do it a little differently. Some schools um, require that the kids come in and meet with a, a AP after any damage incident. Um, we have found that this works well. It keeps the parents, the kids, everybody in the loop. Um, because sometimes we do know if we hand that piece of paper to a student, it might not make it home to the parents. Correct. Um, do y'all have this process written down anywhere or, is, it, or is, is, it, is there a standard practice of this process anywhere? Um, we basically do the same process every year. At the same time, we're evaluating these damages. Any damages we evaluate, we also take pictures of and upload with our web help desk tickets. Uh, we have found this has been very helpful because uh, a lot of times um, kids can have a, a different idea of what initially happened. So we make the kid write out a, um, a form of what the damage was. And we compare it to the damages in the photos and we see in person. Uh, the last, the HP repair technician is the final say on it though they will say whether it's within warranty or not. We've had the devices that were shot with BB guns, um, devices that were ran over twice, um, who wanted accidental damage repairs, but unfortunately that is neglect, and that would be at the cost of the parents. So my question is, again is, where can I find a, a outline process of what, of what is to take place every year? And, and, for collecting, but yeah, for collecting, is 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 there an error there on this? Um, we basically do our standard collection process. I mean, we have we don't really have that written out. The, 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 that that's that that's that that to me that's a concern, just because of the fact that. I, I, I at one instance I have a uh, a parent contact me and told me that they were contacted at the end of July about a damaged computer and I was like why and so she was like well why why are they contacting me at the end of July and school about starting August about damaged computer and 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 that they got, they even just just got to it or, or something and, and I said that didn't sound right I said maybe you need to contact the school and I redirected them to the school but. You know that that's why I'm asking you um, about this um, because after she contacted me, then someone else contacted me and said that they had just gotten a phone call as, as well. That's that's why I'm asking, what's the process and do we have the process spelled out? Because I couldn't tell them that I was kind of lost and I couldn't point them in the right direction of where to get a understanding of, of, of how it should take place and where 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 they can find information at. Some of that could be due to the student circumstances. Was that student in summer school? If that student was in summer school, they kept their device until the end of summer school. And that might be why they didn't get that until July. Um, I would look at that on a case by case basis. Right. Well, what, 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 I'm, what I'm kind of uh, asking for is some type of, of AR or some, or some type of guidelines where we can where we can have something so when we do have this type of case and we have this type of incident happen we can understand what the process is and, and we can go and you can read up on it somewhere so that you can understand it so that there is a there is a, a level of expectation across the district and there, there's a there's a, a district standard on on, on 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 the on the process so that parents can understand it and, and, and community members does, does that make sense um Am I asking too much, Mr. Scribner? Am I allowed to ask that? Uh, you're certainly allowed to ask it. I think that would end this conversation if we just write up basically what you just outlined, Mark. If, <laughs> if you just write that up, have it reviewed to see if there's any loopholes or problems uh, with the wording, and then we can put it out there and folks can know what to expect when they turn stuff in. Um, you know, that might short circuit some questions for the school folks. You know, there's an underlying issue. I think we've talked about this before is that each school may do something differently. And I don't know how you're going to handle that um, in your write up. So I, I understand it's not a, 
it's not a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of thing you're going to have to do. But, but that would end this. And I think it's reasonable uh, to give them an expectation. Um, and also it might line up all the schools uh, to do the same thing. You know, I don't know. Tanya? Yes, sir. Um, I think we, I, I don't want to put Colleen on the spot here, but I can almost guarantee based on the, the quality of her work that we have some internal procedures that we train our staff members on at the school levels. So um, I'm not going to ask anything specific today, but I can guarantee that we have something in internal procedures uh, that we use like we do many other tasks uh, throughout the district. Um, and so we will uh, look back and capture what we already do, um, because I know uh, as a parent, I have seen consistency when I deliver and my child deliver our, you know, her device each year. And they look for the same things every year uh, as we pick up the device or drop it off. So um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely look into that and, and bring back something in our uh, next meeting. Satisfy you, Mr. Smith? Uh, I, I, yes, a long term. Look, I'm just, I'm just, I, I hope, I'm basically, you, I have something in existence already that we will be able to use to as an, as an outline. Is that, is that, is that where I'm understanding? I don't necessarily believe it needs to be an administrative rule. It's there are internal procedures that we do to collect or distribute devices. Um, administrative rule would be something that's more in line, um, more, more uh, in line with the board policies. This is deep down into the depths of, of the operations of the school and the uh, technology department, but I'm certain that we probably, we already have something to that effect and we'll be able to share it with you. Bring that um, to the next meeting. I, you know, I don't, I don't think it really makes any difference whether it's an AR or as long as it's a proper notification uh, to all the parents, that's the point. The point is the parents should know what to expect, and here, here's what you what to expect. Um, I think I think that's we'll see what comes at the next meeting. Okay, well, and uh, all right, sir. So, and we'll see where it's posted and how it's communicated to the parents. All right, Ingrid. Yes, sir. Ingrid. Yeah. Um, okay. So getting back to the issue of, um, from what I understand from what you're saying, Mr. Shohan. The reason that the HP books, and I know we have iPads, those were donated, right? <clears throat> so they came through two. And so I don't know when that refresh cycle comes up, if we're going to try and stick with one vendor and go back to like all HP. Um, only the devices in pre-K did we have some help with the purchase of them. For our K and first grade, um, those were uh, purchased with ESSER money. Okay. So we might be, are, do you, okay, well, that's neither here because we've, now we've got multiple vendors. But one of the things is, um, as I understand it, the reason the HPs are more expensive is because they're designed for K through 12, because they're to be more resilient, right, out in the use. So do we track how many repairs we do on an average basis, how many losses we have, how, many peop, how much money parents are billed? Because when I looked into this a little bit, a lot of districts have different programs. Some districts offer insurance because the other thing is technically if i have a laptop that's stolen or damaged it could be covered under a homeowner's or a renter's policy um and I don't, that's not in any of our literature so i know some districts offer insurance but i'm getting ahead of myself i guess my main question here is how big of a problem is this because a lot of people are concerned and have been hit with 600 700 bills uh for what is essentially mandated by the district it may be it's a very rare situation and we can, or, or is it more common? And then if it is, we are continually running up against a situation where people are getting these large bills and there's frustration and there's inability to pay. I hate to have someone on a promissory note for a $635 computer at $5 a week. Um, and then if, it's, if it is a big problem, can we look at ways in which we can kind of mitigate that effect on some families, especially you know, given all of our ESSER funding and whatnot? Um, we have looked at different insurance programs, and my kids here in Chatham County, we pay $45 a kid for insurance, and yeah. it's basically you either buy the insurance or every bit of damage is on the parent. Um, 
the problem we have is it's hard enough for us to collect our $20 technology fee from all of our students. I don't see how we could collect a higher amount. Um, and then it would get very difficult when you start layering multiple insurance policies and who had it and who didn't on top of each other. Right. But we can definitely uh, get some information for you on some of the different companies that do offer those insurance programs. What I think I would request and uh, see if this goes with the rest of the committee is just a, an understanding of how big a problem it is. How many, because I've had three kids and all their devices and knock on wood so far, no one's damaged one. Um, so I don't know if it is a problem, but I'd like to know how big a problem it is, how much money, how many, how many issues we're having with repair, because it is $635 is a significant cost. Um, especially, and I know there's a lot of frustration when you think you can get the same device elsewhere for half that money. The other thing I would say about that is I'm not sure it's worth the extra $300 for the different quarters that may not be, you know, and then the different strengthening, if we're still getting the same amount of repairs you would without um, that. So those are kind of my thoughts on it. I think there's a lot of frustration with parents about that issue. All right, so the next step is to- I would like to, Yeah, usage, or not the opposite of usage, <laughs> damage. <laughs> and the cost. Yeah. Number of incidents and the cost. And I mean, I'd be interested to know how many parents we have on a promissory note plan or some sort of, you know, how many people can't afford the cost and they're on some sort of promissory note to the district over that. I can get that information for you. Awesome. And we can uh, give that list to Secret Santas. <laughs> David, you're getting whimsical. <laughs> I'm concerned. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm always fascinated that people go into Walmart and pay off the you know, for, for some stranger and they said, okay, well, I'm going to pay off their, their bill. So uh, that'd be great if somebody would step up and pay off the bill for some of our folks, but it is a little whimsical. I, I agree. <laughs> a little Pollyanna coming out in me. All right. Well, so that, that's the next step on this. Okay. Takes us to uh, future topics. I think we have next steps lined up for several of the things we talked about today. So that they'll roll forward to the next one. Um, anything else, Dick? Anything? Yeah, I, I've seen a org chart of the technology department. But I would be curious, I would be curious to see uh, a little more detail in the org chart. I'd like to see uh, job descriptions and I'd like to see um, salary and, uh, and wage information. I know that's sensitive, but we, we have to keep it, keep it sensitive. But uh, I have some concerns about that that I'm sure would be answered if I could see that kind of information. Well, if it is sensitive, then we can't put it out in board docs, and we can't can't talk well, about it. Yeah, well, yeah. so uh, have to be executive, uh, kind of an executive session. But um, all right, Tanya, you tell us. You, you can tell us whether it's sensitive or not. Definitely sensitive. Um, however, uh, in our last meeting, we did provide uh, a brief uh, bullet point to detail by. Uh, the NOC or the Network Operating Center employees. So that provides some, uh, what we felt comfortable providing in public, but also their duties are often sensitive as well. And Mark can probably speak better to this, but you don't want someone who may be absent for, you know, a week on vacation. You don't want everyone, you know, the public to know that they have a specific duty of monitoring the um, you know, cybersecurity and, and um, phishing attempts in the district. So it's not, that not only the, the salary information may be protected, but the, it's important that we are sensitive to the specific duties um, they have with regard to security of our network systems. So I just wanted to point that out as well. 
Um, but I can, we can certainly uh, discuss this with Dr. Rodriguez and, and the request and see what his take is on that. And um, then bring any information or allow him to bring that back to the chair and um, for further discussion. All right, so you'll tell us what is, uh, what's sensitive and needs to be done in executive session. Uh, I'm sure Wendy will give a thumbs up on, on your interpretation. That'll be the, that'll be our next step on that. Okay, Ingrid. Thank you. Um, this is a little more to the ed tech side, uh, but I would like to see if we have some sort of workflow process for the implementation when we get new technology programs or when we change vendors, um, how we roll that out. And, you know, so in a lot of workflow processes, one of the things is you test it. And I know we do that. Um, and then there's like a feedback loop, like how it's actually working out in the field, which I have some, I have some reasons to believe that that part needs to be a little bit more uh, fleshed out. Uh, I think there's a lot of technology that, that goes into the schools and then there's a training piece and, and there's an implementation piece and getting feedback to see how it's actually being used. So if there is like a model that we have or a workflow process that we can look at for implementing uh, new technology or new vendors. Mr. Smith? Uh, not along the terms of what, what he was talking about when, in terms of the um, the salaries, uh, all salaries are public dollars, and, and, and that is public information. Um, so, so I was going to say, that I know that 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 uh, well, what Mr. Guy just asked for, I don't believe that that is uh, that that is public that that is not uh, public knowledge. That's private, and um, their positions, I, I don't believe that 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 should be uh, should be private. But I do know that I do believe that the salaries are, are not, and I do and I do uh, concur with, with with him asking for with, with that report. That he just that he just requested as well. Thank you. Well, we'll let we'll let Wendy be the final final call on what is and isn't. Uh, and, and, and also, when, she, when they bring back the answer, if they say something isn't, also can they can they just show us and write to uh to to help me understand so that I can learn so it can be a learning so that I can I can learn too. So if this ever comes back up, then I can know exactly what to go at and to how to defend my answer. So can they just bring us the bring us the information that's stating that why it is in as well and where we can find the information at as well for uh for further further references? Thank you. I think Wendy usually gives us a site. Most attorneys okay. do. Okay. So you, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we have a nice, nice full agenda for our next meeting. Now, are we on a regular basis, Robin? Um, no. No, no, sir. I got caught off guard on this one. For some reason, I had it out there on the 27th or something. I don't know. Uh, must have been one of those drugs they had me on. Um, so do we want to establish a regular, a regular time each month? Is that worth the effort? I know it would be at an advantage to Robin if she could schedule it. I think we can the fashion wall have been meeting the second Thursday as I go back and look through. Um, well, no, not necessarily. So no, you don't have us. Uh, you've kind of been all over the place. So you don't have an established time. <laughs> it's our whimsical um, board here. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Why don't we all, the three of us, all of us, all three of us, um, get to Robin on what the best day of each month would be and the best time, and then we'll we'll set it up. Yep. Okay. Okay, Tanya. Yes, sir. I just um, just want to mention, in case you select the second Thursday of November, it is Veterans Day. So I'm not, I know that's not a school day. Uh, I'm not sure about staff work day, but um, we might want to avoid that day if possible. Yes, ma'am. I have to avoid that day anyhow, because I'll be up at MUSC, so. 
Well, that's what also one of the constituencies. Kind of a peculiar celebration of Veterans Day, but um, yeah. Well, we'll we'll see what what Robin gets, uh, and then we'll we can all pitch in on and find the best one. Okay. He's wanted to email you. Is that correct, ma'am? I'm sorry. You just want us to email you and Robin then after the meeting. Yeah. We'll yeah, whatever whatever is best. For you. Hopefully, something will jump out and be obvious. And then Tanya, when you you're also uh, included in that, what's best for you? We'll try to during the work day. How about that? And your work day is what uh, seven to nine? Twenty four seven. Just as an FYI, right now it looks like the third Thursday is pretty open. Okay. Yeah, that. It works for me. Me too. All right, we saved a lot of emails. <laughs> um, you will just have to come up with the time. Well, how does this two o'clock work? Works for let's me. Make, let's make two o'clock, and uh, if anybody has a problem, let us know, and we can adjust. All right. So it would be the third Thursdays at two o'clock. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Starting next starting next month. So that would be November 18th. All right. Uh, the only thing left is adjournment. So move. move adjournment. All right. No discussion. Thank you all. Thank you.